Okay, good morning everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Jordan Feld from the Toronto Centre for Liver Disease at the University of Toronto and it gives me great pleasure to be moderating this session this morning, the um, ICHBV um, uh, American Liver Foundation uh, Community Forum. And before we begin, I just want to start by acknowledging where we are today on the, in Toronto, that this is the traditional land of uh, many Indigenous peoples in Canada, but most recently the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit, and now is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And in the process of reconciliation in, in Canada, one of the important things is that we really do think about how many of the policies we've had in the past and, and currently continue have led to a much higher burden of hepatitis B and C in our Indigenous peoples here in Canada. And you may notice that I'm wearing an orange shirt today. This is um, a particular relevance today is, is uh, Canada's first um, national orange shirt day. And I'm gonna just call Carla Coffin up um, from the University of Calgary here to explain the significance of that. Thank you, Jordan. I believe there is a slide about Orange Shirt Day that I had. Yeah, thank you. So as Jordan mentioned, uh, today is the first day we're holding a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, as you may know, Canada has a terrible history of the residential school system in which Indigenous children were stolen from their families and placed in these schools. Many of them did not come home. Um, while they were at those schools, they were often stripped of their culture and uh, taken their, and their clothing were taken from them. And in one particular case, a woman that had worn an orange shirt given to her by her family, was uh, the clothing was taken from her. And so she founded Orange Shirt Day to commemorate this. So today we honor the lost children and survivors of the residential schools, their families and their children. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you, Carla. And I just think it's it's important that we acknowledge that, particularly as we discuss today, the community, which is front and center at our, our efforts to develop hepatitis B cure. And with that, we're going to introduce the session. And uh, I'm going to call up uh, Tim Block from the Liver Foundation to welcome us. Sorry, from the HBV Foundation. Oops. That's all right. Uh, thank should, you should much, very, right, very much, Jordan. I'm Tim Block, uh, president of the Hepatitis B Foundation. And first, I also want to recognize um, the, recognize uh, what, who you're commemorating today, because that is very much a community that that is affected by hepatitis B. And 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 um, and I think it's admirable what what Canada is doing in re in recognizing that. Uh, so. Uh, I'm from the Hepatitis B Foundation, and we are really very, very um, pleased to be able to partner with ICHBV and the International Meeting to, to host this morning's event, which is about bringing scientists, researchers, and the community, the um, using community together, the Hepatitis B community together. Uh, <clears throat> all I'll say is we've seen so many ups and downs uh, since, since uh, Hepatitis B was first identified and since the foundation. Uh, was formed, and it, it has been a roller coaster. Uh, to, I tried to be honest about that with myself and and with my colleagues, um, but uh, but you know I, I do think that there are reasons for new hope, and I'm just going to say uh, that there are, you know, some of the medicines we're going to see when we when we see these clinical trials. We were all so excited. 25, 30 years ago, first with, with uh, the first polymerase inhibitors. Then we got all excited again with the latest wave five, 10 years ago. And there are gonna be ups and downs in these clinical trials. But what I look for, and actually that's a lot about what I, I think September 30th is today is hope, recognition and hope. And there are several medicines coming out there now that are uh, drugs that are being 
in clinical trials that give me a, a lot of hope and I'll have my eyes on those kinds. For example, the, there, are, there are clinical trials of, of drugs out there that are really now altering the course of, you know, of the disease. In some cases, restoring an immune response or even resulting in, in a stable suppression of, uh, of, of the disease or hepatitis B. Uh, a couple that come to mind, I'm not favoring them, Replicor, Merkel XB. These are these are new drugs that that are being tested today. That give me some hope that at least medically it's going to be possible to do what to have see do what we want done. Um, so with that, uh, uh, I thank you all for um, sticking around, and those of you online. I think it's a very important thing to to do, and uh, looking forward to looking forward to hearing hearing and listening to what everyone has to say this morning. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks, Tim. And so just to orient you to the session, we're going to start with an update on the global response to HPV, and we have three speakers in that session, and then we'll follow that with a panel discussion on challenges of hepatitis B in Canada, and, um, and Carla Coffin, again, is going to speak before we have our, our participants in the panel speak, um, join us. And so with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who unfortunately is not here to join us in person, but will be speaking online, and I just remind people both online and here in the audience, you can type in your questions, of course, we'll have live Q&A at the end of the session uh, for people here. Uh, but so it gives me pleasure to introduce uh, Thomas Tu, who's a scientist from the Westmead Institute for Medical Research at the Stored Liver Center in Sydney, Australia. And he's going to be speaking on HBB Science 101. Hi, so my name is Thomas Tu, and I'm here to talk about Hepatitis B Virus 101. And so if you ask a scientist to do this, this is basically what you get, a whole lot of lines, a lot of jargon, really complicated. And to be honest, you don't need that. It doesn't really matter what each of these things is called or what we call it. What's really important are the concepts, okay? And I'll go through each of those in, these, in this uh, short presentation. So first of all, let's start with what hepatitis B is what is a virus? Is it alive? Is it dead? Actually, a little bit of both. I think the best metaphor for it is to think of hepatitis B virus like a seed. It itself is not alive, but it has the potential to become something alive. So when you're infected with hepatitis B at the start, you, you get these seeds and, and they're traveling through your blood. They meet the liver and that's basically where it likes to embed itself and start growing. And this is what happens. And the first thing hepatitis B does is form CCC DNA. It sticks its roots into the liver. And from that, it sprouts and produces more of itself, hepatitis B virus. So that those seeds that come from those newly infected cells go on to infect neighboring cells. Uh, and, and we get a whole lot of production of virus. CCC DNA also allows the cells to produce other proteins from the virus. In this case, surface antigen, which I've pictured here as a leaf. And so in the first phase, in the mute tolerance phase, this is basically what happens. The entire liver is infected with hepatitis B. It's producing a lot of seeds, a lot of surface antigen, but the trees themselves don't appear to actively harm the liver. There's very few symptoms that are occurring when you're in this phase. What happens in the next phase is that the immune response starts to recognize, hey, something's not right, and it's time to clear out these infected cells. I've shown the immune system here as a sort of bulldozer, and it's trying to get rid of these infected cells. And so what happens is the immune system starts to clear the virus, kill 
those cells that are infected. And what it also starts to do is because there's fewer infected cells to produce the virus, you get a decrease in the amount of HPV DNA that's circulating. Eventually, with enough immune response, you start to clear a lot of the virus, okay? A lot of the virus infected cells. And so you have a very low amount of HPV DNA in the blood. But what happens, the virus is very tricky. It produces these new forms that only produce surface antigen. And that's important because surface antigen allows the virus to hide from the immune response. This surface antigen seems to uh, block the view to uh, virus infected cells. And so it becomes, it, it can't clear every infected cell. Moreover, there's still that CCC DNA that's still there. And those can, new trees can sprout from that, new seeds produce from that, and you get new infection events. New, that, those seeds can now infect uh, new cells and start to produce more virus. The immune system recognizes this again, and that inflammation uh, restarts. So in this phase, you have a lot more virus in the blood, a lot more liver damage. And that becomes a problem because that inflammation is linked to liver cancer and liver disease. And we're trying to get rid of that. When we're doing blood tests, we're trying to figure out what's actually happening in the liver. Um, so as you know, HPV DNA tests for the amount of virus that's in the blood, surface antigen, obviously the amount of leaves in the blood. When we get an immune response against surface antigen and clear it all away, we know that without those leaves, you can't produce new trees. And so that person is protected or cured. E antigen is really tricky, but it's basically used to determine whether you're early on in those first two phases or later on in the latter two phases. When we go for treatment, we're basically covering the, the liver and stopping the virus from producing new virus DNA, new amounts of virus. However, that CCC DNA, the infected cells, the surface antigen, all still there. So there's still risk because when we stop taking that, those treatments, then the virus comes back. New virus is produced. So how are we going about trying to cure the infection with these new drugs? Well, there are three different ways. And the ultimate cure will probably be a combination of these uh, uh, strategies. The first is to remove the underlying infection, including the CCC DNA. So we get completely uninfected cells already now in the liver. This is actually really hard. So there are other ways to suppress the virus from producing new proteins. That is to say, we can't produce new leaves or, 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 or uh, seeds. CCC DNA may still be there, but may be completely suppressed. And that may be a way to, to induce a, a sort of uh, maybe incomplete cure, but still functionally active cure. And there are other ways entirely is to activate the host's, our own immune responses to ultimately help our bodies completely clear the virus infection. And basically, um, uh, John 
will be talking in the next talk about the ways that we've come up and were presented at this meeting to be able to do all of these things. So thank you uh, and happy to take any questions at the Q&A panel, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I think we're going to move on with all three speakers and we'll have some time for questions at the end. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, call up John Tavis, who's from St. Louis University and is going to talk to us about the road to HPV cure. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night, depending upon where in the world you have to happen to be. And uh, especially thanks to uh, Thomas for that creative uh, description, considering he's in Australia and it is the middle of the night there. So in any case, uh, before I get going, I also would like to acknowledge the pain and suffering of the indigenous people of Canada. The United States also has a truly shameful history of this and we are not yet to the point of rec reconciling properly. So, okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you about what cure therapies are in process and uh, advances that have been made over the new over the last time since we had one of these uh, public forums down in in Melbourne, and so some of this stuff was reported at this meeting. Some of the stuff is just in general. I'm not going to favor any one particular product, although there will be a couple of examples. So, the goal here is to improve therapy, and one of the best ways to do that is use combinations to get something called drug synergy, which is one and one plus. One plus one equals three, which reminds me of the way my sons used to do arithmetic. Okay, so um, the combination therapy is almost certainly going to be needed because HPV has many, many different genotypes. That means different strains of it, essentially, and they cause a widely varying disease, as Thomas just described. So it's really unlikely that one drug will be able to cure everyone. And it's also likely to be fairly long. My guess is we'll eventually settle on something that'll take about a year, but that is truly just a guess. And so the best way to follow uh, progress is to um, uh, go to the Hepatitis B Foundation's Drug Watch, and I've got the link down there for you. This is a resource I use myself a great deal. So one of the big advances that's occurred over about the last year and a half is a better understanding of something called the half-life of the CCC DNA. You can see here in this curve, that's a half-life curve. We nerds like to look at things like that. But in any case, what this does is describes how fast it goes away. And there's a particular number called a half-life that measures that. The CCC DNA has a very long apparent half-life in the, in the body during therapy. And for a long time, we thought it was because it was super de duper stable. But recent data that are very good are indicating that it's not nearly as stable as we, we had thought it was and its half-life is somewhere between 11 and 22 weeks in the patients that were studied in this study. And the reason that's important, and it is really important, is because a half, short half-life means that shorter treatments may be uh, possible and also different types of treatments can work that we hadn't anticipated could have worked before. One of the big classes that appears to be a winner that's coming along is something called capsid assembly modifiers. These uh, interfere with formation of the viral capsid. You can kind of think about that as the, the shell of the seed uh, using Thomas's analogy. There's a whole bunch of them in development. You can see the clinical development stages here. Um, and they have very promising antiviral activity. So for example, 13 to 41 patients treated with this one particular experimental compound had undetectable HPV DNA after only 29 days of treatment. Now, of course, as usual, some drugs have failed in the trials, but that's completely normal. But many, many of these are, are, are coming along and are very well tolerated. And one of the issues that we're watching carefully is it appears that HPV develops resistance to some of them relatively easily. One of the big scores that we got recently was a drug called Merculid XB, also called Hepcludex, and Bulavertide, is that how you pronounce that? <laughs> you can help me here a little bit, Jordan. Okay, <clears throat> in any case, this is an injectable drug that stops HPV, and uh, it's a, a parasite virus called DHPV from uh, entering cells. And so to use Thomas's analogy, it, it keeps the roots from getting into the cell. 
and it is conditionally approved in the Europe versus hepatitis D virus. That's important because hepatitis D virus enters cells the same way hepatitis B virus does. And US approval is being sought as they're going through the final stages of the, uh, of the testing process. And I'll be absolutely shocked if uh, this drug is not approved in the United States once the trials are completed. Okay, so durability of HPV suppression by siRNAs. siRNAs are another promising class of drugs that are under development. They're little teeny short pieces of, of DNA that get into the cell and cause HPV's RNAs to fall apart, okay, to be broken down. There's a little picture here. And uh, so if you break down the mRNAs, you, break, you don't allow viral protein production. There's, uh, they're into phase one and phase two clinical trials. And one of the things that was really interesting that came out about, oh, maybe nine months ago, something like that, is 15 of 38 patients who responded well to this one particular experimental compound had durable post-treatment HBS antigen suppression. Now, that's not predicted by this mechanism of action, which means something else is happening. And that could be due to reactivation of the anti-HPV immune responses, which is the bulldozer in uh, Thomas's analogy. That would be super de duper exciting. Um, or simple persistence, the siRNA in cells. And I'd rather doubt the second one is true because it's not known that many siRNAs do that. Another area where there's a lot of work going on right now, and it's looking really cool, is therapeutic vaccines. Now, many of us have been vaccinated. In fact, I think everybody in this room has been vaccinated against uh, COVID. And that is when you, uh, you inject somebody with a little something to cause their immune system to become really active against that target to prevent the disease. Um, people have tried this with HPV for many, many years to try and, and use it as a drug to, uh, to clear the virus, but that hasn't been working. Um, because um, the, the virus is very sneaky and it, it actually fights back against the, uh, the bulldozer as, as Thomas indicated. Um, however, there's been some nice advances in understanding of the immune system uh, that are, are leading to successes. These are likely to be used in combination with drugs that suppress HPV DNA. And there's a whole bunch of them going into clinical trials. And I'm really quite excited about this. This, this could really do some good, but it'll be a little while before we, we find out for sure. Then uh, there's a functional cure by something called nucleic, nucleic acid polymers or NAPs. Uh, these are, uh, uh, again, pieces of little short pieces of DNA that block secretion of HBSAG from the cells. So in Thomas's analogy, again, that would uh, produ uh, stop production of the, of the cloud of leaves that, that's out there. In a phase two study of 40 patients with the NAPs plus tenofovir or viriad and pegylated interferon alpha, uh, they had some very good results. Flares occurred in, in the patients that had really good responses, and that's believed to be mechanistically associated with the good response. But the thing that always makes me excited about this one is, is almost 40% of the patients in this trial appear to have achieved a functional cure, which is, to my knowledge, the best that's been done yet, and it's pretty exciting. Okay, so uh, what, what did we just learn at this meeting over the last couple of days? Again, this is a highly personal uh, approach to it. You ask two scientists, you're going to get four opinions. And so th this, is, this is mine. So I, I like some really cool tool development stuff. We had some organoids, induced mold plur pluripotent stem cell organoids uh, that will give us a really good tool that will model the liver better so that we can do a better job of designing drugs. There is uh, advances in producing continuous flow HPV purification, which reduces the labor and expense to, uh, to do infection studies. And there's been, uh, been some improved infectable HEPG2 and TCP cell lines. These are the uh, workhorse cell line that we're, uh, that we're doing. And those come from our glorious chairman here, uh, his lab. So, okay. So, and then there are some newly identified drug targets and or drug candidate advances. Again, these are highly personal opinion from my, me. Um, the, the core protein or HPC is, uh, was discovered to be sumulated and that sumulation reaction is a, uh, a potential target. There's a form of a funny structure that occurs in some DNA is called G quadruplexes. And there's some nice advances going and trying to target that some, uh, poly A polymerase inhibitors. Again, these are involved in, in RNA metabolism and those are looking pretty good. Uh, and then there's a RNA degrade degrader, it accelerates the breakdown of RNA that I've heard about here. And these are just things that caught my personal attention. 
Um, we also have a deeper understanding of drug mechanisms. There was a nice study indicating that NK cells, which is a type of, of uh, uh, immune cell, can scavenge pegylated interferon alpha and reduce its efficacy. And so that might help us uh, find a way to have a higher number of patients helped by pegylated interferon. There is confirming data uh, that was presented by Thomas II showing that CCC DNA is lost upon mitosis. That means those roots in the liver cells get lost when the liver cells divide to make more liver cells. And then again, uh, there's a nice story developing about sRNAs actually turning on one of the mechanisms that the cell has to shut down the CCC DNA permanently. And then there was a nice new biomarker idea, which is gonna be really important for cure therapies because that big cloud of leaves that Thomas discussed, which is HBSAG, gets in the way of us trying to figure out what's going on in the course of therapy in some patients. And so this might be a way around that. So I'm pretty excited about that. So with me being now two minutes over, uh, over I do apologize, but there's an awful lot of stuff going on that's so exciting. So the goal is a functional cure. And the functional cure is just a name. It's going to be as good as a regular cure for the patients. And so we're all excited about that. It's going to be almost certainly require uh, combinations of drugs that work in different ways. There's many, many promising drug candidates that are being developed. I mean, there is truly the kitchen sink being thrown at this, at this virus. Functional cure rates of up to 40% have been seen in a small phase two trial, which indicates that we're making really good progress in trying to improve therapy. And the biggest message uh, to echo what, uh, what uh, Tim said at the beginning here is there is hope. There really truly is hope and I am optimistic. Thank you. Thanks, John. That was a great summary of a huge amount of data presented over the last couple of days. And I would absolutely second or third that point that there is hope and a lot of progress being made, which is exciting. And now uh, Sherry Cohen from the HPV Foundation is going to tell us how we're going to use those new drugs to actually get to HPV elimination. Thank you very much. Let's see. Great. I would like to thank Thomas and John for helping me understand um, the, the pathway to a cure. It was really helpful, and, and I've never heard I've never heard it um, synthesized that way. So thank you very much. I'm going to switch it up a little bit and talk about what we're doing globally towards eliminating hepatitis B worldwide and the role of the community, the role of the community of people around the world living with hepatitis B. So I'm going to start a little bit with the goals. Uh, we are working very hard to eliminate hepatitis B by 2030, and the WHO has called for very specific and very ambitious goals in terms of diagnosing almost everyone in the world who has hepatitis B, making sure that almost everybody is getting into care, um, and that we're preventing new infections. And so you can see a lot of goals uh, between 65 and 90 percent. So those are pretty lofty. And let me tell you where we are. According to a study that was just recently done by WHO, right now, worldwide, it's estimated that 296 million people are living with chronic hepatitis B infection. That's almost a 4% global prevalence, which is pretty high. Uh, in 2019, there were 6 million children younger than age five that, uh, that were infected. And so according to WHO, the 20 2030 or 2020 goal actually was 1% prevalent. So we're just about there, although that's still a lot of new infections per year. And I'm sure we'd all like to see that even lower. There were 1.52 million new cases of Hep B in 2019 estimated. And of course, for a vaccine preventable diseases, that's still very high. Um, in terms of birth dose of Hep B vaccine, which we all know is necessary to prevent pr transmission uh, long-term, but also mother-to-child transmission, about 85% of kids, babies born worldwide were given birth do were given um, the hepatitis B vaccine during the first year of birth. The goal for 2020 was 90%, so we're just a bit short there. But look at, at global coverage for birth dose, which is very necessary uh, for, for babies, especially those babies born to infected mothers within the first 24 hours of birth. The goal was 50%. We're still a bit short there. In, it, that, was, that was 2020. 
Um, now, I, I want to point out the, the huge gaps here with diagnosis. So in 2019, only 10% of the people worldwide who have hepatitis B were diagnosed. And the 2030 goal is 90%. So we have to, make, we have to increase our diagnostics uh, by 80% in the next nine years. That's, that's huge. Um, and again, if you look at treatment, only 22% of those diagnosed and 2% of the total are on, we're on treatment in 2019. So we have a long way to go, um, but the good news is working together, we can get there. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to work together. And I think that's one of the reasons we're here today is making sure that all of the key stakeholders have what they need and can work together to help prioritize elimination of hepatitis B. What do we think the role of the community is? So at the Hepatitis B Foundation and with partners around the world, we've been working over the past number of years to talk to people who are living with hepatitis B around the world and ask them what they want, what they need, and what do we think and what they think their role is. And so People living with hepatitis B around the world can help us understand the impact on their lives. What does it mean to live with hepatitis B? They can help us understand what they want. What do you want from future treatments? What is it you want to get out of treatment management? And what do you want from clinical trials? You can help us to make drug and clinical trial development more patient-centric and patient-focused and help make clinical management, long-term clinical management more meaningful. So for example, clinical management doesn't only have to talk about your HBV DNA level or your ALT level. It can also talk about how are you feeling? How's your anxiety? How's your quality of life? Things, all of those things are, are really important, I think, in terms of clinical management. Additionally, we need every one of the 296 million people living with hepatitis B to become advocates. We need people to share their voice and help us to create a global voice to prioritize hepatitis B elimination. And that means helping us find more funding for a cure, for cure research, find more funding and urging, urging countries and governments to develop and fund elimination programs around the world. Uh, we know that there are many countries that are starting to look at elimination of viral hepatitis. Some countries only have elimination plans for hepatitis C. We wanna see every country have elimination plans for hepatitis B and hepatitis C together, and we need to fight for that. We need to help, help our hepatitis B community advocate for screening and vaccination practices. So right now, for example, in the United States, uh, hepatitis B vaccination for adults is risk-based and hepatitis B screening for adults is risk-based, which makes it very, very difficult. And in fact, means that few people are diagnosed in the US and few people are vaccinated, a few adults are vaccinated. So right now the CDC is reviewing and updating those guidelines. In fact, yesterday, uh, ACIP had a meeting to look at potentially expanding adult vaccine guidelines to become universal. And so we are very strongly advocating for both universal vaccination guidelines and universal screening guidelines. And hopefully we can do that around the world. So we have been talking with people who have hepatitis B and collecting data, both quantitative and qualitative over the past few years, especially. Um, and I wanted to point out some of the new things that we're learning, which I think We've all kind of known, but it's really important to have it documented so that the scientists and the clinicians can, can hear the voices of people who have hepatitis B. And what we're seeing is that there is a significant physical, emotional, and social impact for those living with chronic hepatitis B infection. And that includes um, fear of dying of liver cancer, fear of transmitting hepatitis B to others, things like pain uh, and fatigue, so lots of, of um, physical impact, but also social impact. So people who are self-isolating because they feel like they, they feel like they have hepatitis B and might pose a risk to others. So they self-isolate or people who are isolated and, and shunned by the community due to the stigma around hepatitis B. And overall, we see significant impact on long-term relationships, on long-term education and careers, which of course impact and reduce quality of life overall. And what do people want? So we did a survey of 2,100 people uh, back in 20, I can't remember what year it is, back in 2020. Um, and it turns out there's this, it's pretty clear what people around the world want. 
loss of surface antigen with a finite treatment and decreased risk of liver cancer. Those are the number three things, the top three things that people want around the world. So what we know is that people who responded to the survey said that they would be willing to deal with some side effects and some inconvenience if there were a 50% chance or greater of a functional cure. And that quality of life outcomes were also really important to people while they were going through clinical trials and also through overall clinical management of hepatitis B. So, so we're starting to learn what is important to people with hepatitis B. And what we wanna do is help more people share what's important to them. So here are some opportunities for engagement for people who are joining us here or joining us online. Um, there are lots of ways that you can share your voice anonymously or not anonymously. We have a Hepatitis B Action Center where you can take very quick action to advocate for policy change. We have our Just Be Storytelling Program, which is our U.S. storytelling program, and we also have an international story program called Be the Voice. You can share your story through video, through, you could write down your story, you can help us, help you share your voices around the world. Um, we are also, we have recently just started to document discrimination experiences around the world, and we just started this last month. We have already have over 90 people who have documented their discrimination stories. We urge you, if you've experienced discrimination, regardless of where you are around the world, please do go to that link and share your discrimination experience with us. And of course, we know that there are a lot of clinical trials happening right now, and there are a lot of clinical trials that will be coming down the pike in the future. So please you know, go to our website, use our resources to learn more opportunities for how you can engage and, and help us to eliminate hepatitis B. And happy to answer any questions, if there are any. One question here that comes up um, and was sent in here was about the term in the community of should we be moving from functional cure to cure? This is always an issue for people. Are you functionally cured or are you really cured? So what do you what do you think about that? So that, that's a great question. So one of the things we did with the survey and in 2020, we also hosted uh, with the FDA, we hosted an externally led patient focused drug development meeting. And we posed a lot of different um, sort of names for what it would look like, functional cure or, um, Joan, what else did we use? Remission, we posted like four or five different top potential names. And honestly, functional cure resonated with a large majority of people. It was, it was the term that people seem to like and understand the most. That's good to know. So please, if, if people do have questions, you can either send them in online or if there's anyone in the audience, you can uh, go up to the microphones. And maybe I'll start with a question for John. Um, just you talked about the different combination therapies and you, you gave the, the possibility of sort of a year of therapy. What do, you, what do you think of, do you think that's actually realistic that even a year is, we may, or do you think we might need longer, especially if we go with antiviral strategies as opposed to immune modulating yeah, therapies? Go, uh, is, is the mic on? Okay, if we go with uh, pure antivirals, which I personally believe is possible, although I have friends who disagree with me vehemently, um, uh, I do think we, we may well be looking at a two or a three year uh, a treatment course. The immune targeting strategies such as therapeutic vaccination uh, have the potential to be much faster, uh, but you know, it's, it's just, just a guess. Honestly, I think a year therapy right now is a stretch goal for the first waves of, of treatments that will come online. However, it is important to note, note that the first wave of treatments that come online will not be the last wave of treatments that come online. We'll gradually improve things till eventually we get where we need to be. Great. Thanks, John. I, I, I tend to agree with you. And, and maybe a, a question for Thomas. Really nice. Uh, thanks for joining us from so far away and, and really, really nice uh, way of framing the virus. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll push you a bit and say, what, what do you think as someone who focuses more on the virus side of things, do you think we're going to need um, antivirals or immune therapies or both uh, to get to get the cure? Oh, I, I think really, um, Having looking at that drug watch uh, page, we we have so much and so many tools that are becoming available to us that um, I I think it it would be 
silly not to to use everything that that we have um, available to us and and so I think combination therapies will be um, the the way forward and 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 the tricky part will be figuring out um, exactly what kind of combinations, how long, um, how all of those synergize together. And, and so that's why we need a, a lot more, um, you know, research on, on the fundamentals of what the virus is doing in, in a patient and, and how it's going to react and all of that sort of thing to sort of predict in this whole, you know, range of, of drugs, you know, if you have 50, 50 factorial is, is, is a huge number. Um, of combinations that, that are possible. How exactly are we going to, to do this? Um, that's going to be a, a really tricky part. Great. Thanks, Thomas. I, I, I totally agree. There's so many different ways of combining it. And then you add in the complexity of finding the right combination for the right population as well, which yeah. has a whole added element to it. Uh, we have a question in the audience. Joan. Yes, hi, my name is Joan Block from the Hepatitis B Foundation. I have one comment, one question. So uh, behind Thomas II's head, you see hepbcommunity.org, and that is an international patient forum that Thomas started, and it's something that the Hepatitis B Foundation, the World Hepatitis Alliance, is very pleased to be part of. I also want to say that between uh, Thomas, myself, John Tavis, and many other people who participate, it's been a growing community of people around the world who have an opportunity to, to ask questions, share their very personal stories. So in addition to the Hepatitis B Foundation's Just Be program and Be the Voice, there are increasing opportunities for patients to um, share their stories and concerns. So just wanted people to know what was behind Thomas's head. <laughs> and, and, Thanks, uh, and people other than patients are welcome to, to, to participate. We welcome it. Uh, the question I have for Dr. Cohen is, you know, it's pretty stunning to see the gap between where we are and the WHO 2030 goals. I, I'd like to know, not to put you on the spot, but what do you see as um, some of the key steps to, to go from 10% to 90% of diagnosis? That's a great question. Um, so we need quite a lot, but I think what we need first and foremost is prioritization. I think we need governments to recognize that hepatitis B elimination is a priority for them. And I think they need to put policies, practices, and funding into place to make it happen. I mean, I could go into, legitimately, we need point of care testing to make testing easier for people who have hepatitis B. We need to be able to make treatment access easier. We need to make vaccination access easier. But if the governments and the large funders around the United States, around the, the world, if they don't prioritize that, we're not gonna meet elimination. Can I ask a follow-up question to that and just say, how important do you think treatment simplification is? Because I know one of the challenges is that is, is finding providers. And then, I mean, as Thomas nicely illustrated, the natural history of this infection is so complex that with our current guidelines, figuring out when people need treatment, and it's, it's interesting to me that the WHO has targeted treatment targets of a percentage of people with hepatitis B infection rather than sort of people that in quotes meet treatment guidelines. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think simplifying treatment is going to be, is critical. I think, um, you know, we, we see even in the US, it's really difficult outside of hepatology, outside of specialists, it's really difficult to, to, uh, to get people into treatment, um, long-term treatment and management. However, we can simplify guidelines, we, we need to, so that we can take treatment out of the hands of specialty medicine, because in a lot of countries, specialists, there is no access to specialists. And so if we can put, treatment to some extent in the hands of primary care practitioners, it's gonna be really important to do so. Um, and I, I also know that there's been a call over the last couple of years for, for test and treat, right? So kind of getting rid of all of the, the difficulties. In a way, it's similar to you know getting rid of the 16 groups that you have to screen for high risk groups to screen, right? So just making it easy. And if someone is service antigen positive, putting them on treatment. Thanks, Sherry. Colina? Hi, my name is Kalina Yim. I'm a nurse practitioner from Toronto. Well, thank you all the speakers for the um, wonderful information. So I have a question for Dr. Cohen. So you touch on the social impact of um, hepatitis B. And in your survey, did you look at the impact of the 
ultrasound surveillance for hepatoma. Um, we all know that the guidelines suggest regular ultrasound surveillance for HCC, and, and I have many hepatitis B patients in my practice, and they are saying that it's really emotionally draining because of this unknown, like every six months they have to go for ultrasound and they wait for the phone call. And that is very strange. I'm just wondering if that has been looked at. Yeah, we, we've seen that. We see that over and over. Um, and it's, it's one of the reasons why people don't sustain care, right? So especially people who are off antiviral treatment um, and who feel who, where the fear of developing liver cancer is higher because they don't feel like they're, they're able to reduce their risk. So, in, and also in a lot of, in a lot of cultures that we've worked with, um, it's, it's um, liver cancer is not something you talk about because you, if you talk about it and you look for it, then, then you might actually increase your chance of finding it or increase your chance of making it happen. And so I think there's a lot of barriers to ongoing, screen, ongoing surveillance for liver cancer. And so we need to find ways to make it more culturally acceptable um, and easier for, for people to follow, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Tim? Uh, thank you. Uh, again, I really enjoyed the morning talks. Uh, so I'm Tim Block from the Hepatitis B Foundation. Again, I just had a thought, since this is also kind of our activist group and panel as well, it occurred to me, and we raised this with, with the U.S. government authorities, with the advent of all of the, of the universal testing for COVID exposure, I wondered if there was any opportunity or, or you saw any opportunity or chance to kind of leverage that for testing for other other diseases like uh, hepatitis B is what we were proposing. It would have seemed to have been a, a great opportunity since there were collections going on and over a billion collections worldwide. Yeah, I mean, that sounds logical, but the practical and political barriers to it are unfortunately very great. I'm reminded of a of a, a cure meeting I went to in Mexico City a few years ago, talking with a bunch of HIV researchers about the possibility of just adding HPV um, screening in their routine screening of the HIV patients in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it was not met with the enthusiastic uh, support that I had hoped it would be, because it seems like a fairly simple and fairly cheap thing to do. And this is even further apart uh, from that type of work. So although I completely agree that this sounds like a very good opportunity, I don't see how it's going to be executed politically. I don't see the will for it or the money for it. So I'm, I'm going to say with a slight bit of more optimism, I tend to agree with you, John, but I'm, I'm going to say we have piloted some programs of testing for hepatitis C and people getting vaccinated for COVID um, and also looking at using dried blood spot testing for testing for the, the three viruses. So looking for serology for COVID and then also looking at hepatitis B and C infection and um, some promising promising uptake of it and, and support for it, but definitely to get, uh, I think, national and certainly global uptake. I think you're right that there's a lot of barriers to overcome, but I would second the point, Tim. I think it's a good idea that we should be trying to think and leverage some of the opportunities that have come out of the COVID-19 experience to try to advance a public health approach to addressing chronic viral infections. Can I just add, sorry. Oh. Yeah, Tim, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Thomas, go ahead. Yeah, um, I guess I, I wanted to highlight that if, if we're, we're going to be doing that, um, that there needs to be support for the patients um, upon that diagnosis. Getting that diagnosis is a really highly emotional thing. Um, people, uh, we've seen on the forum that people don't get the information that they need um, at diagnosis and, you know, think they're going to die straight away and, and all of this sort of thing. So that um, support and guidance needs to be there um, at, at that point of diagnosis as well. It's not just that, that test that has to occur. Yeah, uh, absolutely critical point. And, and just to highlight that point, we have made sure that people are immediately linked to care and get the information yeah. with pre and post test counseling before that's being done. But I, I, you're 100% right. So I'd like to just keep, a, keep sort of mindful of the time, thank our, our speakers and, and for uh, their great talks and answering some questions. And we're going to move on to the community panel. Thanks. So our next uh, speaker, it gives me great pleasure to bring up uh, 
friend and colleague, uh, Carla Coffin from the University of Calgary, who's going to talk to us about the HPV epidemic here in Canada. To start the slideshow. Beginning. Okay, great. Thank you, Jordan. Um, so thanks for the invitation to speak. And um, I really want to congratulate the organizers for, for doing this because even I think now more than ever in the era of sort of social media and fake news and <laughs> and conspiracy theories, it's very important to have these sort of scientific and, and community partnerships. So these are my disclosures. Um, I work at the University of Calgary and me and my colleagues with the Calgary Liver Unit do a lot of clinical trials on liver disease. So we had a meeting with my uh, members with the Canadian Hepatitis B Network about a week or so ago. So these are researchers and scientists and clinicians who care for people with hepatitis B. And I asked for their advice on what I should talk about at this forum. And these were the top three things that were mentioned. The first was that hepatitis B is not really recognized as a problem in Canada. You know, there's no data. And so the public doesn't think we need to devote any resources or funding. The second thing is that we're proud of our universal healthcare system, but is it really universal? You know, there are important problems with our healthcare, especially when it comes to prescription drugs. And then lastly, there are severe limitations in our hepatitis B childhood vaccination program, which is ridiculous considering we've had a vaccine for over 40 years. So let's start with the data. If you don't know the data, you can't address the problem. So although we have a notifiable disease surveillance system, there's been lack of standardized reporting. And in the past, it didn't even distinguish between acute versus chronic infection. So I'm from Newfoundland, that's here way on the east coast of Canada. You see here, zero, there's nothing reported. And I know that there's hepatitis B in Newfoundland. <laughs> so other large provinces have published data. So British Columbia, for example, has shown that over a 20 year period or 30 year period, there's a lot of people living with hepatitis B. Many of them have chronic infection. They come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and in, especially in the Asian community. In Ontario, data has shown that hepatitis B is a fifth leading infectious disease cause of death. Another survey study showed that many people were unaware of their infection, and we highlighted this in the previous presentations, is that you need to diagnose infection in order to monitor and see whether people need treatment. So raise your hand if you think getting a liver transplant is an outpatient procedure. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, good, good, very good. Um, so I don't want to be sarcastic, but if you go to the Public Health Ontario website, if a public were to go and Google this, they would see that in 2019, three people were admitted to hospital for hepatitis B. Now, this is ridiculous. <laughs> we know this, right? Um, I asked Jordan yesterday, I said, how many people in Ontario got a liver transplant last year for hepatitis B? And there were actually 20 people. In Alberta, where I'm living, this is sort of in sort of Western Canada, over the last five years, there were 21 people with hepatitis B that got a liver transplant. And this doesn't include people that are admitted for liver cancer surgeries, liver cancer treatment, etc. So obviously, there's a problem with the data. So Dr. or uh, Morris Sherman, he's former chairperson of the Canadian Liver Foundation, he did a, a report uh, about, uh, I guess, five or six years ago. And he based his report on immigration statistics. Um, we're fortunate to live in an open and diverse country. Many people come from highly hepatitis B endemic regions and are living in Canada. Based on this data, he said that by 2020, we could have up to 400,000 people living with hepatitis B in Canada, but they don't know they have the disease. So in order to address this data gap, myself and my colleagues within the Canadian Hepatitis B Network uh, collected information from our clinics. So this is a referred sort of specialist clinic. Uh, we included eight provinces, including Newfoundland, where I'm from and where there's zero data. And we found that uh, in over 9,000 people um, that have a hepatitis B, a significant proportion had advanced liver disease or stage three fibrosis. 
the majority were foreign born, but there's a notable percentage, I think about 9% that were actually born in this country that should have received the hepatitis B vaccine. And importantly, there were significant differences in sort of drug treatment coverage across the country. Another more recent study, we looked at hepatitis Delta. So I believe this map was shown a few days ago by um, uh, somebody at this meeting. You see there, this is Canada, it's blank. There's no data on hepatitis Delta. Um, so in order to address this, my colleague at the National Microbiology Laboratory, Dr. Carla Oshue, uh, looked at the reference sample testing. So in 7,000 people tested, 5% were found to have hepatitis Delta. So believe it or not, it does exist in Canada. Um, a significant proportion were viremic or hepatitis Delta RNA positive. A lot of them were Canadian born. Many of them had advanced liver disease. And this is important when we think about all the new treatments that are coming through the pipeline and the need for monitoring these patients. And, and so diagnosis is key. And as expected, there were a variety of different genotypes um, from uh, representative of different regions around the world from which these people had, had come from. So this is a question for Adam when he writes his Canadian citizenship exam. Who is the father of universal health care in Canada? We're very proud of this. This is um, uh, Premier Tommy Douglas, who was the former Premier of Saskatchewan. Um, 10 years ago, there was a vote and he was considered the greatest Canadian. But there are limitations. Um, even though health care is considered universal under the Canada Health Act, it's up to the provinces to implement it. And because of that, there's been differences in coverage for different drugs, differences in vaccination schedules, lab testing, screening practices, uh, a special difference between rural and more remote and urban areas. And then finally, uh, because of um, significant disparities and language barriers, um, it's impacted especially immigrants or new people to, to coming to Canada. And these have been shown to have a higher, high, higher lifetime risk of end-stage liver disease. I am happy to say that some of this has improved recently. This was a study that was published a, a couple of years ago and I got them to update this slide for me, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Kong and Dr. Bramania. And fortunately, some of the um, more potent drugs, tenofovir and entecavir that were not covered in British Columbia and in Ontario uh, now do have uh, better coverage. So I wanna finally end with the hepatitis B vaccine schedule. Everybody in this room knows, I want to uh, highlight to the public as well, that the best time to give the hepatitis B vaccine is at birth or under the age of one, because that is the highest risk of becoming a chronic carrier. Older children and adults are actually more likely to clear infection if they become, an, if they become exposed. Although I do agree that we should have a universal vaccination program for adults as well. Despite this, Despite this, which has been known for decades, five provinces, including the largest province in Canada, Ontario, does not give the vaccine until pre-adolescence or until grade, until grade seven. So Dr. Feld and his colleagues at the University of Toronto did an important study recently, and they looked at administrative lab data for children born in the province of Alberta within the last decade, and found that dozens of them born here acquired hepatitis B in Canada. Yeah, yeah, so you see this, you, you see this number. This is entirely preventable. Yeah, yeah, so anyway, I, 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 I think it's shocking and I think we really need to, to address this. So myself and colleagues and other expert societies, we wrote a letter to the Minister of Health in April. We wrote it to the National Advisory Committee on Immunization and the President of the Public Health Agency and told them you need to have universal birth bill vaccination. They wrote me a very nice and polite letter of response and told me that this is a provincial jurisdiction. So it's up to the provinces to implement birth dose vaccination. In conclusion, I totally agree with the Hepatitis B Foundation. You know, we are lucky to live in a wonderful country, but there are a lot of things we, we need to do to address disparities in Canada. We need to increase screening and linkage to care. Um, innovative models of care, I give some examples on these slides, which are especially important for more rural and remote areas and for disadvantaged communities. We, need, we have a liberal minority government, so increase advocacy, increase funding to advance a cure and liver cancer, universal pharmacare, you know, drug coverage should be universal across the country. And then finally, I call on the National Advisory Committee on Immunization to endorse universal birth dose infant vaccination. 
Um, so I'd like to thank all of my colleagues within the Canadian Hepatitis B Network, um, Canadian societies and organizations that support our efforts, and my research uh, coordinators based out of the University of Calgary who has helped with various studies. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. And if there's any questions for Carla, we'll take a minute just before people join for our uh, community forum. And I see, um, so I see people going up to the mics, but maybe I'll, I'll start with a question, I guess. Um, so it, in, in the provinces where we do have birth dose vaccination, do you know what it took for that to happen? Because we, we struggled yeah. in Ontario. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, like Alberta didn't have it until 2018. Um, I, I did like send emails and talk a lot about it. I don't know if that made the, or what sort of <laughs> got, the, got the message out. Uh, but one day I, I learned that, oh, it's changed. So that's good. So I, yeah. I can tell you it's been very frustrating. We, you know, we were always told, well, show us the data. That's why we generated the data. And now we still haven't been able to get a change in policy. Sure. Thank you, Carla. That was amazing. Thank you so much for highlighting some of the biggest challenges in Canada. So the hep delta diagnosis and outcome rates are really disappointing. Do you have any thoughts on what could be done to improve? It looks like there's only one lab. That yeah, yes, yes. And I, th I thank you for bringing that up. There's only one lab in Canada that does hepatitis delta testing, and that's the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg. Um, we are hoping that um, we're, we're hoping to do a study with the provincial lab jurisdictions uh, for increased screening for hepatitis delta. And maybe after that study, we might generate the data to show that's a problem. I mean, I mean, that's the issue. If you don't have the data, nobody's going to recognize it as needing to do anything about it. Just as a, as a call to the scientific community, I would say better diagnostics for Delta are also important because mm -hmm. one of the reasons fewer labs have it is that there is some challenges with the diagnostics. So yeah. Yeah. continue to work on that front. We're going to just in the interest of time, we are going to move on to our community forum and, and have a couple of our panelists join. And I just want to announce, I'll remind people at the end of the session as well, but for anyone that's joined this symposium now, the ICHPV symposium, which is following this immediately, you're all welcome to stay on for that. So just to make sure people are aware. And so it uh, gives me great pleasure to in invite our first two uh, panelists, um, Craig and David, who are going to tell their stories. And then uh, we'll hopefully have at least one more panelist joining in a moment. So maybe I, I um, so Craig, maybe if you want to go first, and then we'll turn it over to David. Great, thank you. Uh, so in the summer of 1990, uh, 31 years ago, after uh, just recently moving to Vancouver, I became very sick and had to take a couple weeks off work. Uh, I assumed at the time I had caught a ras rather nasty strain of the flu. That fall, I found a new family doctor and went for a general checkup, part of which was to send me for routine blood work. Uh, the results came back and I had tested positive for both HIV and hepatitis B. I was 21 years old at the time. Uh, my doctor was rather blunt with me. He said I had a 50-50 uh, chance of living to uh, 30 years old. The priority at that time was staying alive and treating my HIV with the new drugs and combination therapies that evolved over the next decade or so. 30 came and went, and my HIV had become ma more manageable, a chronic illness. Uh, 20 years ago, the HIV meds weren't perfect, but I began to realize I'd be around for much longer than I had originally thought. My liver and kidneys started acting up at different times. My liver enzymes were elevated for several years to the point uh, that I began to worry that uh, I wasn't, it wasn't going to be HIV that did me in, in the end. Over time and with changes to my HIV and hepatitis B meds, my condition stabilized, which is where I've stayed for the past several years. Over the years, my systems become resistant to some drugs such as tenofovir. So even though I'm stable now, I worry about the future. Aside from sharing my HIV di uh, diagnosis with my, my mother within a few years of being diagnosed, it took me many years to overcome the shame, enough to begin sharing with my close friends. I don't think I ever really got, overcame the stigma, stigma of hepatitis B, though. I'm still ashamed to speak about it. With HIV, I have a, the gay community with shared experiences, and I don't think I have that same connection to a community of people living with hep hepatitis B. So I worry about what other people will think. 
my husband and my family know that I have he hepatitis B and that I've, I've never felt uh, comfortable enough sharing with others. Uh, over the past few decades, I've also worried about uh, traveling with hepatitis B and HIV meds, particularly at uh, international borders. In a way, my diagnoses have been a uh, positive impact on my life, though. I've led a healthier life. I don't drink, I eat healthy, I try to exercise, and I try not to take life for granted. I'm also fortunate to have an, uh, access to excellent health care with my HIV meds covered and uh, my dual coverage through work uh, um, cover my hepatitis B medication. I recognize that I live a privileged life and I worry about those that don't have the access to the same level of treatment that I receive or those that have not been able to overcome the stigma of this disease or who have faced discrimination. I made a commitment to speaking up about both uh, hepatitis B and HIV, and I realized that by being silent, the stigma is uh, perpetuated. I'm still early in that journey, but I hope I can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig, for sharing your story um, and uh, and for speaking out. You're, you're right that that is the very important and first step to addressing this, the stigma. Um, I'll turn it over to David to share your story as well. Yeah, my name is David. Um, my hepatitis B story started in 1991. My family doctor, Dr. Dawson, one day he said, there's a lot of patients get hepatitis B and your duration rate. So let's go to check on your uh, uh, hepatitis B status. And it turned out I was a hepatitis B carrier. Right away, they, they vaccinate my, my wife, my kids. And ever since I was a carrier for many years, until 1907, I went back to Hong Kong to work there. For three years in Hong Kong, my health is just as good as before. Nothing happened. So I know myself as still a hepatitis B carrier. Until year 2000, I went to Beijing and work in Beijing. And the workload is heavy and it's always under high pressure. For the first year, my health is just as good. But in the second year, I got a problem. Every three months, I got fever. So I don't know what happened. So I went to the hospital, they gave me uh, the uh, drugs and I'm, I'm fine. Three months later, I got fever again. So after two years, I decided to uh, retire. So I went back to Hong Kong. I went to the hospital and one of my friends, he's a director of a hospital. He said, okay, come in and check it out. And I found, and I find out I, I got had the active hepatitis B then. They kept me there for 10 months and under the watch. And I said, I want to go back to Canada. He said, no, wait till nothing happened. Everything's civilized. So after 10 months, he released me. And with a whole deck of uh, documents about my uh, hepatitis B finding in the hospital. So I came back with a heart, with a document. I went to uh, my family doctor. Then it was uh, Dr. Eisenberg. He, he read the, the reports and he, re, and he referred me to uh, Toronto Western Hospital, to Dr. Heathcote. And she was the director there then. And, and also Colina Yim. And I was under Colina Yim and Dr. Heathcote's care. And everything is fine, everything is okay, but I still got the hepatitis B active. And then later on, when Colin and Tim had an idea of uh, starting up a kind of support group, and she initiated the idea, and I second for that. So about a few months later, we formed up a Chinese liver support group in Western Hospital. And now we moved to what Toronto General Hospital. And under, right now, I'm under Colinism, and also Dr. Johnson's care. So after all this year, my health is, is it's good. No, no more fever, nothing. So it's stabilized in, the, in this case. But as far as the group is concerned, we have a seminar six times a year. 
And the idea of having a group is try to educate the Chinese people because we, I found out there's a lot of Chinese in China, when they get a hepatitis B, they think it's a deadly disease they got. They stack themselves away, they do, will not see anybody. They thought it's very contagious and they don't want to tell people they have hepatitis B. What happened is they tell people they have hepatitis B, they lose their job. And nobody want them, even the family don't want to touch them. So they just stack away. At that time, they have no cure. They have no knowledge about hepatitis B and have no medication. They just stack away and die. That's how, how, how horrible it is in, in that case in China. So in here in Toronto, we try to educate those people. Right now, we also extend it outside the, the Chinese group, try to educate people in our group and help them whatever they, we, we can do. So right now, thank God, I'm under the uh, care of, uh, of Dr. Jensen and uh, uh, Kalina Yim. I'm good. <laughs> right now, I'm almost 80 years old. So that's how good it is. I believe we live with the liver, forget about the disease, and live like a normal life. And I do exercise every morning. OK, I do Tai Chi. I'm a Tai Chi teacher. So it's free to teach people. I find out Tai Chi give me a better immunity of all, all disease. So thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks so much for telling, sharing about the, the, uh, our, the support group that Colleen has uh, helped to organize. It's really been very helpful for uh, the people that we see at the, at the Toronto General, Toronto Western Liver Clinic. And now Morales uh, joined us as well. So if I can turn it over to you to share your story as well. Thanks. Hi there. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for saying my name correctly. I know it's a little bit difficult sometimes, but you said it perfectly. Um, I, um, I guess I'll start with a little bit with my background. Um, I was actually born with hepatitis B, um, you know, in a time and a place where people didn't check for it. Um, actually, my mom didn't even know she had it. Um, and so, um, in case you're wondering, it was in Afghanistan back in the late 80s. Um, and so, you know, I, I found out when I came to Canada as a child that I had it and it was always just something I had. I mean, I wasn't sick. I didn't have any symptoms. So it was always in the back of my mind. You know, we had our yearly checkups at um, Sick Kids Hospital and then I got transferred to uh, Toronto Western, I believe it was at the time with Dr. Jenny Heathcote. Um, and I just went once a year. It was never an issue. Um, and it was more so something that became more at the forefront um, of my thought when, um, you know, my mom suddenly got sick and, and, you know, she passed away really unexpectedly, um, you know, and I'm sure it was, you know, some, the liver had something to do with it, of course. Um, and then it sort of became, you know, something that I was constantly thinking about. Um, I went through two pregnancies as well. And so there's, you know, of course, a lot of monitoring and it really made me realize, you know, how blessed I was um, and how thankful I was for, you know, all you guys who are putting so much of your time and effort into researching and, um, you know, committing your life's work to improving um, the lives of people with hepatitis B because, um, you know, I, I'm sure that you see the results on, all the time, but it, you know, it really does work because, when I had my children, I was able to vaccinate them and things like that. And that's never going to be an issue that they have to worry about. And it, it's kind of, you know, bittersweet how easy it is to, you know, prevent it, but at the same time, time how widespread it is. Um, and so that's why when um, Kalina asked me if I could uh, speak here, I, I jumped at the opportunity because, um, you know, I may not look like a typical person who has this chronic disease, um, especially because I don't really have outwardly symptoms, but it's just a reminder that many of us are dealing with things um, that do affect our lives. And, you know, after my pregnancies and things like that, I did join a, um, a, a study, um, a clinical trial, and I was always for it because I wanted to do my part um, 
to you know improve and i know dr jansen was saying that you know the treatments we have here are, are a little bit different than what's available maybe in europe but i would like canada to you know sort of catch up and anything that i can do to help i would love to do um but you know one positive to having a chronic illness especially as a young individual is the fact that um i'm very you know health aware or health conscious and and really i make sure to to take care of my body and forget when we're younger this chronic disease um but i won't talk too much i know there's um Thanks, Morel, for sharing and for I think one of the, the common themes that all three of you talked about was really that that in a way having had this infection hepatitis B with or without HIV has really led you to leave, lead healthier lives in other ways and really take your your health seriously and be aware of it so that those are some of the I guess some of the positives that come out to it. So I'm going to open it to the um, audience to either online or here if people have questions for the panelists uh, to to talk uh, please feel free to to um, uh, pose your questions and maybe I will start with one and I I guess I'm going to start with um, it, with asking Craig you, you talked about some of the you know, the, the challenge about speaking about hepatitis B and, and the challenge about speaking to your family and to other friends and colleagues. What, what are some, in, in having gone through that, are there any tips you'd have for people that are maybe struggling with the same challenges of things that worked well or things that helped you overcome some of the, the concerns or fears? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is just to, to realize and it, took me a long time to come to this realization is that there's nothing to be ashamed of. Like, uh, we all have challenges in our lives. We all have uh, different uh, concerns and whatnot, and not to worry about what other people think about you. Speak about it because others might be going through the same challenges and you might find something, uh, a response from other people that um, will help kind of bolster that, or you might be helping them and just speaking about it. So overcome that challenge of, uh, worrying about what other people think and think about, well, you might be helping someone else by having that conversation. I'll, I'll definitely speak strongly to that, that really normalizing, the, the more people that do talk about it, the more people realize that sort of, as Morel said, you don't obviously recognize that someone has hepatitis B infection. And that's, I think, one of the challenges is that it really is sort of the silent, silent epidemic, silent killer. And it is really just recognizing that it can affect anybody and, and really, speaking about it does reduce and in, increase awareness and reduce the stigma. John, do you have a question? Yeah, this is John Tavis. I'm a professor at St. Louis University in the United States. I want to start out by thanking you very much for sharing your powerful stories. Uh, I have two of my trainees in the room, and it's very important for them to hear uh, the stories of the people that they are struggling to help. So I want to thank you for that. But my question is for uh, any of the three of you or all of the three of you is in this room, uh, there are a large number of scientists who are working very hard to provide a cure to patients uh, like you. What is one thing you want to tell each of us about what you want out of the products that we're producing or at least trying to produce? Um, if you guys don't mind, I can go ahead. Um, I what I think is really important is accessibility. Um, I know the medications can be very expensive. Um, and so I think accessibility is a big one. I definitely agree. You, know, you can have the best drug in the universe, but if it isn't getting to the patient, it's not doing any good. Mm -hmm. David or Craig? Any? Yeah, I think um well truck is one thing uh, it helps and from the patient point of view we don't know we just take the the pills and we don't know whether it would help or not but one thing on the education side we have to really teach the people don't worry about the hepatitis b because this is the people believe as a killer 
they worry, the worry will deepen their, their, their sickness. So just tell them, don't worry about it. Live as it as you are and live with it. It, 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 it will not go away or will go away. Don't worry about it. And some people told me or the doctor told me, you got liver disease, you won't die of liver disease. <laughs> you die with something else. So people are afraid because they contact something because they're afraid of death. That's a problem. So drug is one thing. And hopefully, like Jennifer said, the drug is pretty expensive in a way. But unfortunately, we have help from the government to my, with my age, like over 65, the government help on the drug plan. But, uh, but some people are younger and that they, they really have a, a, a drug uh, uh, burden issue, especially the people from China. They, uh, they find a way to get the drug from China and ship back to Canada. Obviously, they can buy these drugs cheaper, the same drug cheaper in China, which is manufactured in China. So this is a, a one thing. Hopefully, you know, the drug price will come down and help a lot more people that way. Thanks, David. Craig, you have one ask for, for the scientists in the room? Yeah. I would say the same thing uh, about accessibility. It's uh, There's such a disparity, it seems, uh, across provinces uh, here in Canada. And I'm sure that uh, the United States has their own challenges as well, but uh, just making those drugs available to everybody at, uh, uh, um, uh, accessible to everybody, uh, no matter where they live, especially in rural communities and, and whatnot. Thanks. Thank you. If, if, if I can make a push and ask you to advocate for the, the, the birth dose vaccination. So uh, this is something that uh, Carla brought up in her talk that we don't have universally here in Canada. They do, fortunately, in the United States and in the WHO has asked all countries to have that, but yet we don't have it here in a country with a pretty good healthcare system otherwise. So that's something where I can tell you that politicians uh, everywhere listen more to people telling their own stories than they do to doctors advocating for things. So we, we can yell and scream, but hearing your voices is much more important. So um, adding, adding those to the discussion would be helpful. Um, Sherry, Sherry, you have a question? Thank you very much. This is Sherry Cohen from the Hepatitis B Foundation and David Craig Mural. I just wanna thank you so much for sharing your stories today. So I, I have a quick question. You've all gone through your journey and gotten to a place where you're comfortable talking and sharing. Do you have any, for us in the public health scientific clinical community, what can we do? How could we help others get to the place where you are, where we can make people more comfortable talking about their experiences? Is there any advice you have for us on how we could help? I think the very important for the people who've got this uh, hepatitis B, the patient himself speak out because like a lot of people they have it and they they bear it themselves they don't want to tell people they have it but for myself i always talk to people hey i'm i have had that is me but i'm under control so it's good and you we try to educate them so they'll be open up and they will get help if they don't open up themselves they will get help just like the people in China, they stack themselves away and sit in and wait to die. So to open up, to help them open up, is, it helps a lot. Um, I think what David was saying, um, I think part of it is um, normalizing this disease. Um, of course, people are always afraid of things they don't understand. And so maybe at a younger age, um, for example, I know here in Canada, we vaccinate, I believe in middle school um, and, you know, sort of getting a lot of information out there. So people know what it's about, what it is, um, and that, you know, you don't always have symptoms and things like that. And it, it may just be something dormant. I mean, maybe just explaining it, but I know personally for me, what made me more comfortable to talk about it so publicly is that I you know, really trust my uh, my doctors and um, Kalina Yim, who I, I, I've known like my whole life. And so I think that bedside manner that um, doctors have or nurses have with their patients can really, you know, kind of make or break their outlook on things. And, and so, you know, not to add any pressure because I know that there's, you guys are always juggling so many things, but I think um, 
when there's that good relationship and, and the patient trusts you, um, they'd be more willing to talk about it and sort of not see it as, as depressing news you need to hide. That's, that's a good point. <laughs> Craig, did you want to add anything or? Yeah, and I think uh, like some of those statistics that uh, Dr. Coffin had shared earlier were, uh, were quite astounding. I didn't realize that so many people uh, around the world and uh, here in Canada uh, did have the disease or um, I guess we don't really know that a lot of them do have the disease if there's no, uh, not good reporting. I think just letting uh, patients know that there is a community out there and to try and uh, reach out and have that conversation with others living with the, the disease. Great. Well, thank you all for sharing your stories. We're, um, we're, I'm, I'm going to now uh, call on Professor Harry Jansen to come up, who you've heard uh, provides care to some of the, the folks that are on with us today, and he's just going to have some closing remarks for our community forum. And uh, thanks again to our participants and to everyone here for, for joining. Thank you very much, uh, Jordan. Thanks all for being here. And, and also thanks uh, those watching at home or wherever around the world. So let me just summarize quickly what was said and then have a few personal remarks here. I think we had a great meeting really. Uh, it's good to see both from a patient perspective as well as from a science perspective, how we can move on. <clears throat> and just to start with the different talks, um, Thomas clearly, Thomas too clearly told us, is the virus dead or is the virus alive? Well, the virus is dead until it enters the body and then it becomes alive, just like COVID. So you have to be careful about it. And he also showed that the immune system in, in a way takes control over the virus in sometimes in the natural history of the disease. And we hope to really replicate that with new treatments, which hopefully will be around. Then John Tavis uh, explained us what these new treatments are about. You can either block the viral replication, so you can block the virus <clears throat> and try to cure the disease, or you can tickle the immune system to such an extent that it uh, activates or reactivates and takes control over the virus. And these are very, there's all new development. It's a very exciting area. Um, and really there is hope, which is one of the last slides that he brought exclamation mark. And I think there really is, because there's a lot of studies ongoing around the globe. Now that we've tackled the cure of hepatitis C, a lot of companies are reinvesting the research dollars in hepatitis B. Uh, and I really hope to come up with a cure, let's say in five to 10 years from now. Then, then Cherry Cohen gave, gave us the, I would say concerning figures that some of you know, but some of you don't. Uh, of the uh, 300 million chronic hepatitis B patients around the world where only 10% is diagnosed, believe it or not, and 2% is treated, which is just devastating. And 820,000 patients per year die. And she also told us the physical and emotional social impact that, uh, that really gives. And, and the problem really with liver disease, with hepatitis B specifically, <clears throat> that it is, um, it is a very silent disease. And... Uh, uh, the, the patients don't have symptoms, as Jordan said, and are often diagnosed too late. And we've also did some studies that unfortunately, even in Canada with, with a relatively good healthcare system, that a lot of patients with hepatitis B come in with liver cancer, and they haven't even been diagnosed with hepatitis B. And if we would have caught these patients like one to two decades earlier, we could have treated them and we could have really prevented these nasty complications of this disease. <clears throat> then Carla uh, Coffin gave a very nice talk on the, on the three problems. Uh, the first one is HBV is not, quote unquote, a problem in uh, Canada. Well, it is a problem. And she showed the data and there's a very, really a lack of data among different provinces. And we, have, we really have to work on that. That's important. Um, <clears throat> the universal health care and particularly the um, that, which is overall pretty good, but there are definitely problems with, with, with uh, reimbursement of drugs. I can tell you when I came over here from Europe in 2013, I hadn't been prescribing lamivudin for, I think, five to 10 years. And then all of a sudden here in Canada, I had to do that, which is, was for me kind of a medieval drug. And um, it's a bit better now that Intactivir and Tenofovir are reimbursed for the majority of the patients, but it can definitely be uh, still, we can still improve on that. <clears throat> And last but not least, she, she uh, told us about the child, uh, childhood vaccination. 
which is really something that should change in, in the, these five provinces who, who don't uh, who still don't do it and we do have data so we should really challenge them to to change these policies and um, because if you give it right at birth it's done with the other vaccinations it's very simple <clears throat> and then you prevent infections in early childhood the other problem is if you do it at the age of 12 some of these youngsters just don't do it anymore it's very difficult to catch them and to be and them to be vaccinated so last but not least we we had uh, the, uh, our three patient partners uh, uh, greg david uh, and morel and it was again very clear to me what the stigma of hepatitis b and hiv is how we don't always realize that even not as doctors but it is it is it's just devastating to uh, to have to having to go through this the other points that were raised is the treatment access um, the HPV peer support group, David, very nicely showed what you can do yourself, like the work that Kalina Yim has been doing um, with the Chinese hepatitis B patients, which is, uh, let's say, 70-80% of our patient population here in Toronto. It's just phenomenal. And you can stand up and you can do something yourself uh, to, to create more awareness, uh, which is really the way forward to, to implement change. Uh, Morel talked about the pregnancies, and she also talked about the importance of clinical trials. And that's that's another thing that I really want to advocate for and, and stress the importance, really, that it is, I mean, we're now all treating with these antiviral drugs, which are very effective and suppressive, yet not curative drugs. But these very effective drugs have only come to the market because patients in the past were kind enough to participate in trials and, 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 and to be treated with them. And millions, millions of people around the globe are uh, are benefiting from that. <clears throat> so how how can we improve things? And what are the, what are the reasons that hepatitis B is for us is not so? Uh, everyone knows about HIV. Uh, if you if you if you if you get someone on the street here in Queen Street, you, you ask what is HIV, they'll tell you. You ask what is HBV, it's very often silent. <clears throat> so we all have to speak up. And I think some of the problems. Unfortunately, is that some of our patients are not uh, are on the lower steps of the social ladder. They are often immigrants who don't speak the language very well. Another problem of this disease is that it it takes, I would say, three to four cabinet terms, maybe five cabinet terms, from infection till death. And that's and politicians, unfortunately, are only interested in you infected today and you die tomorrow. Then it gets into all of the newspapers. But but with chronic hepatitis B. <clears throat> The infection lasts very long and, and patients don't have complaints and die like 30 years later on, which is definitely a, a, a problem for that. The other, the other thing we would have to work on is the statistics, as Carla already mentioned. A lot of people have hepatitis B, yet it, for instance, in the mortality statistics, there is no hepatitis B. It just says liver cancer or it just says liver failure. So for politicians, it's very important because they, they are just number crunches and they look at numbers and they always whenever we we go to the government and jordan mentioned this already with the studies that we've done they always ask what are the data so we have to get better data uh, to really convince them to get better treatments to diagnose patients earlier and to get also treatments that will cure patients thank you very much thanks harry so that concludes so i'd just like to again thank the hpv foundation and ice hpv for putting on a community forum i think it's been a great uh, way to begin the the the, the ice hpv forum which will be following this and again uh, anyone who's joined this community uh, forum is welcome to stay on for the ice hpv forum we're going to take a short 10 minute break and be back here at 9 15 to start the ice hpv forum uh, thanks again <laughs>